Welcome everyone to our final presentation. My name is Dana. I'm Jennifer. So here is our project, If I Were You, a VR law enforcement tool to challenge implicit biases. Okay, so here we have, we just put a little collage together so we could reflect on the whole perm, which with the photos that we had. So here we have the showcase up here from last week, um, users engaging in our experience, and then we have our poster, and then here is um, some elements that Jennifer with the recording of the 360 camera. Um, yeah, we did the recording together, and then this is um, kind of a screenshot of how, how we process the raw recording, and then um, everything else, yeah, happened in the showcase, kind of uh, capturing what happened in the past few weeks or so, I would say. Um, and we're gonna talk more about things that happened before that. <laughs> okay, so the project overview. So our goals here, so our whole project goal in the beginning um, was to explore the potential of VR in reducing implicit biases in policing. And then our targeted audience, it was a general public uh, or sorry, it, it transformed to the general public, but in the beginning it was law enforcement professionals. And our intent, intended impact, I believe, has it has stayed the same from the beginning. So it's to foster empathy, improve decision making, and reduce bias in high stress police encounters. And then the implications of our research is in order to provide insights into uh, VR's potential for challenging biases and fostering empathy in law enforcement training overall. Okay, so here we have our pivot slide. So basically, this was our, our cute little design here of where it all started somewhat. So doing interactive VR and then we transformed to 360 degree video. Um, also, our whole beginning of the research that we focused on was on embodiment literature because it's so powerful. However, due to the limitations of our study, we switched this to spatial presence. So this is an update that we recently did. And then also targeted audience, we wanted to interview police officers, but we changed, or sorry, we started with police officers, then we went to criminology students, and then we just did the general SFU uh, student body. And then also for our research question, this has changed also. So our previous research question focused on embodiment. That was our key thing that we wanted to prove. Um, however, we've adjusted this just to pivot and because this overall will help, uh, this narrows the scope of our uh, final research that we've done. So does experiencing the perspective of a person in crisis facilitated by the immersive nature of VR, of the VR experience, increase empathy toward outgroup members? Okay, and then so our research and design. So the literature review, um, the key things that we have here within our paper. So the focus was understanding VR's potential in policing, education, and training. So looking at how VR can have a positive impact within education and actually benefit police training. And then for spatial presence, it's the feeling of being there. So this is the thing that we have updated compared to embodiment and then also implicit biases in policing. So these are the key, these are the three core elements that are guiding our paper. And then as for the user research, so low acceptance of bias training, therefore proceeding to the initial target being police trainees. And then looking at the theoretical frameworks, so social identity um, theory and labeling theory, this, these have been the two guiding theories for our entire project. So. Social identity focuses on the in-group and out-group uh, individuals in society, and therefore labeling. Um, labeling is a simple theory, but it's so powerful at the end of the day because, and these two theories work hand in hand with one another. So, sorry, social identity is in-group and out-group, and then labeling is just kind of an additional element. So those who are negatively labeled in society, they therefore for will internalize this and they will it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy of them living up to the label. And then, so the influence on our prototype here, so integration of spatial presence 
and VR is immersive features to enhance empathy. Again, empathy is a key thing within our project and emphasizing realistic scenarios and emotional engagement. Yeah. Okay, so now we're moving on to how we uh, impl uh, implement all those theories in our prototype. Um, so our final, like Dana just described, we pivot a lot, but our final VR prototype was a uh, 360 degree video um, and video experience, sorry, uh, simulating bi police bias in a real life crisis scenario. So we pulled from the same um, news article that we presented before. Um, this individual, uh, his name is Kane, um, experienced policing brutality when he was just walking on the street and in a good mood and somehow got misidentified uh, and um, captured, captured, quote unquote, uh, arrested, quote unquote, uh, by the police. Um, so we adapted the same plot, however, placed it in a nighttime um, environment um, to kind of uh, paint, painting this uh, uncertainty and this uh, sensation of uh, um, um, worriedness, um, things like that. So feature, key features including perspective taking through pers first person view. So we uh, spent a lot of effort trying to um, shoot the 360 video from a per first person view without having ourselves be in the scene. That was really challenging. Um, but we ended up basically holding the camera, like cover ourselves as much as possible with a hoodie, with a mask, and then uh, hold the camera as, um, try to hold it above our head so um, it can capture uh, without like our face in front of the, the user. And then uh, high immersion um, through sound and visual elements. So again, we uh, hold a lot of attention on the sound, um, including the sound effects um, and also the monologue or the inner voice uh, by the um, by the uh, main character. So we actually had a voice actor who's a black uh, male to do this voice acting. Um, and then finally, it's an emotional sensory cues uh, designed to provoke. Uh, empathy. So I think a lot of those elements, uh, the ultimate goal was the emotional empathy um, cues. Yeah. Um, again, I know everybody, I don't know why it's not playing. Okay. Uh, I know a lot of you have seen this, so I'm not going to like talk about it through and through, but um, just want to have this in the background, letting you know uh, what it looks like. Um, so, so yeah, it's nighttime, and then basically the person walks in and then all the audio play throughout. Um, there are some limitations and challenges we faced with this version of prototype, which we are going to address later as well. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so yeah, and then from there, uh, we have taken some ev evaluation strategies to test whether our uh, intervention is working or not. All right, so we're taking this mixed method approach, uh, basically through two channels. One is a survey for qualitative data, and we had nine people total fill out our surveys, um, and uh, one semi-structured interview for qualitative data, and we ended up having six participants. So keep in mind that it was actually quite different from what we designed initially. Initially, we want them to do an IAP test first, a pre-survey, and then do the experiment uh, experience, and then do another post survey and do a uh, instructor, uh, sorry, interview again, a total of a one and a half to two hour experience. However, it was just impossible for us to do <laughs> this time. So well, we, we ended up just doing this on the showcase basically. So it's gonna be just one post um, survey, which, sorry, is right here, um, that targets um, connection, immersion, um, presence, and cyber sickness. So for the first three themes, connection, immersion, and presence, we're trying to understand if the experience actually can um, have the potential for uh, to invoke uh, empathy and emotion, and if it's uh, and if the participants can feel the spatial presence uh, in the um, environment. And um, those were pulled from a paper written by Kosher et al. from 2019 about a similar. Uh, VR experience that they built. 
Um, so they used that survey. And then the Cypher Sickness uh, was posed on the Simulated Sickness Questionnaire, SSQ, and we posed several questions from there to evaluate if it's, uh, if that caused cyber sickness for the participants or not. We choose not to do a general usability testing because there's no interactivity within um, the experience. Um, and then speaking of that, for the interview questions, uh, it was semi-structured. Um, we ask, in, um, so the basic themes are emotion, confusion, reflection, and cyber sickness again. Um, uh, we try to make things quick, so it's gonna, uh, it was very targeted, how did you feel? Uh, and very open-ended as well, like how did you feel, what emotion did you um, experience, was there any parts that you feel confused about, um, and then um, we, uh, from their answers we um, follow up and ask them more questions. So, give me time again, <laughs> some key findings. Um, basically, participants felt strong immersion and some empathy towards the all group members, we realized that it was not very clear to some participants that um, they are viewing from um, a victim of the case perspective. They were not um, the silhouette, um, so it, I, I might not give enough context, but for people, you all have experienced it, so supposedly there should be a silhouette on the reflection uh, on the glass door, but it was not clear enough for a lot of people as well. Um, however, they did felt empathy um, to some extent, even though they some may feel confused whether they're taking the first person first person perspective or not. Uh, they thought they were bystander uh, in that situation, but still felt the empathy towards uh, the case because the audio and the narration were so strongly um, influencing. And then. The second one is uh, participants feel low to moderate cyber sickness in their their environment. So uh, people did experience some, uh, to somewhat degree, uh, dizziness and um, dis discomfort. But uh, our um, data shows that it was relatively low. I think it was below the uh, scale average um, in general. Um, and then finally, um, there are a lot of areas for improvement, like I said, clarity um, in the narratives and visuals, um, participant role identification, which I just mentioned, and some technical advancement, advancements such as embodiment elements. We still think the embodiment part is gonna be very strong and could be incorporated into either a very well-designed, um, well-modeled, um, VR environment or can be um, incorporated into a 360 video like what we did. Uh, but to some degree, we really want to enhance that part. Um, and yeah, so now moving on to our learning. Again, we have, I feel like we have faced a lot of challenges, you know, the technical limitation uh, on the initial ideas that we want to approach. Uh, and then there are some issues with the narrative and the scene clarity that I just mentioned. Um, I wish we could improve on that for future iterations. Uh, technical difficulties like the motion sickness. One thing is that we were having a hard time holding the camera um, to keep, keep it sturdy enough so that it can minimize motion sickness. We tried our best, but um, um, some people still um, experience that. So that's a challenge of ours and then the emotional engagement as well. So speaking of the audio part being so powerful, some uh, participants reported that uh, they tend to zone out or ignore the audio part because the scene was such a stressful uh, situation that mentally they want to avoid it. So they, um, speak, so they, they avoided the audio, making them even more confused about the visual um, because a lot of not many things were shown in the video. So we tried to find more ways to uh, uh, engage with the um, participants emotionally without triggering them too much. Um, so what we developed, you know, on this side, what did we develop, um, what skills did we develop, sorry. Um, so the VR design production definitely, uh, even though we ended up not implementing anything we built in the Unity, we still have learned a lot of skills that uh, through our iterations, and we did use that for our um, previous prototypes. 
um, showcase experience, of course. We all went through this, user-centered research, um, trying to target, uh, because how much we pivoted from, sorry, because how much we pivoted from, um, from our research, it was really, uh, we tried really hard to keep track of the users that we were targeting throughout the project. Um, and finally, the data analysis, um, and then which was quite new, at least for me, um, and then uh, applying theoretical frameworks to design. Um, some key takeaways. Um, so, the importance of user feedback in refining the immersive um, experience. Uh, we've learned a lot from our users just simply by asking them in the showcase. Um, we are being a tool to invoke emotions and potentially challenge implicit biases. You know, our ultimate goal is really um, still trying to uh, challenging the implicit biases. Although uh, this research is um, is more like exploratory uh, work towards that goal, uh, we still see the potential of Sorry. No worries. So the current limitations, we've said these, so I'll just briefly go through these. So um, focusing on university students, this limits our generalizability. The lack of embodiment and body ownership in the, is currently in the current prototype. And then technical limitations like motion sickness and an unclear, unclear narrative flow. So these are things that need to be worked on um, in a future project. And then future direction, so just uh, incorporating the body ownership and full embodiment to enhance empathy. Uh, we really like these things, so any future project we do, we will work hard to incorporate these. And then testing the long-term effects of VR-based interventions. Well, a lot of the literature shows that um, there is no longitudinal studies testing the same product that we uncovered based on uh, reducing implicit biases. So this is something that would need to be done and then expanding the user base uh, to include law enforcement personnel or criminology students would be um, next. And then our conclusion, so overall, we did determine that VR can significantly impact the reduction of implicit biases in policing, and then this is through fostering empathy and enhancing the perspective taking role. And then the impact we have is the potential for VR to serve as a transformative tool in law enforcement training um, to address systematic biases. And then our call for action is just to continue research into VR in interventions for diversity and bias uh, reduction training programs focusing on law enforcement. Yeah, that's it. <laughs>